Hello and welcome to ITV News Meridian in the Thames Valley. Tonight's headlines. Two of three teenagers killed in a crash in Oxfordshire are named. Friends gather near the scene in Marcham as the road remains closed. Parents, children and teachers from the Thames Valley protest in London over what they say is a failure to support children with special educational needs. Unless they've got children who have a disability, I don't think they do understand what we go through on a daily basis and how difficult the system is. Citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Also on the programme, ahead of Windrush Day tomorrow, more personal experiences of people who settled here and the project to pass their stories on to young people. And could you help look after a puppy like Eric? We're at a Reading charity that needs more foster carers for guide dogs in training. Good evening. Two of three teenagers killed in a crash in Oxfordshire have been named. Elliot Pullen was preparing to celebrate his 18th birthday. Daniel Hancock's family said he lived every day to its fullest. They died when their car that they were in crashed into a tree in Marcham yesterday. Penny Sylvester has our report. Today there's been a steady stream of youngsters arriving at the crash scene, united in their grief over the loss of their friends. One of the youngsters who died was Elliot Pullen, who was about to celebrate his 18th birthday. This afternoon, his family described him as having a gorgeous smile and a cheeky glint in his eye. They said, Elliot should have had an amazingly bright future ahead of him, a life of adventures and seeing the world. It's now been cut short by this awful tragedy, leaving behind a shattered family who will miss Elliot beyond words. The family of Daniel Hancock, who also died in the crash, have paid their tribute, as they described how their worst fears were realised in the early hours of Tuesday morning. We take some solace, they said, in the fact that Daniel lived every day to its fullest, surrounded by friends who became family. We're heartbroken that his last day to do this has come so early. To his friends, he loved you all. The accident happened shortly after midnight on Tuesday morning, the teenagers were in a silver BMW travelling along the A415 between Marcham and Southmore, just west of Abingdon, when it left the road and hit a tree. The three passengers in the car died in the collision, while the 18-year-old driver was taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries. Today, the road was closed as forensic officers carried out a detailed examination of the site to try and establish exactly what happened. A neighbour said he was woken by the crash. Well, I was half awoken during the night by a loud bang and properly woken, I suppose, about an hour later by what sounded like a large group of people chatting. Uh, I looked out of the window and saw some blue lights and also some arc lights and possibly a fire engine. Uh, the clear up operation went on for most of the night. At about uh, half past six yesterday evening, they, they decided to close the road pending an investigation, which I believe didn't start until mid-morning today. The forensic evidence uncovered by the police will be revealed during the coming inquest. Family and friends, meanwhile, will come together to share and support one another in their shock and grief. This is All Saints Church at March and behind me, and the churches at this time become something of a focal when people need to share their grief, uh, very often at tragic events like this. Uh, the vicar of this church, Reverend Nick Weldon, said, Marchim is grieving alongside the community of Southmore, which is where the teenagers came from, about a 10 minute drive from this village. He said the church will be kept open every night until nine o'clock and special prayers will be said on Sunday. Penny live in Marcham, thank you. The families of three friends killed in the Reading terror attack three years ago say a new memorial in Forbury Gardens will keep their memory alive. James Furlong, Joe Ritchie Bennett and David Wales were killed in June 2020. Last night their loved ones gathered for a special church service. Natalie Verney reports. The sun shone and the music played. 
It was hard not to be moved by this display of solidarity from the people of Reading. The three men so needlessly killed. Three years ago, James Furlong, Joe Ritchie Bennett and David Wales were sat relaxing and enjoying the sunshine when they were stabbed to death by an Islamic extremist. Although years have passed, the pain lingers on, which is why a permanent memorial was unveiled yesterday by the mothers of those who died. There's a mixture of pride and emotion today. Obviously, it's very difficult for us when we return to the uh, gardens because at the end of the day, it's where David, uh, James and Joe m m met their deaths, which that part is sad, but it's, it's nice that you know, we come here and all the people the, from Redden are basically, and they're, they're being honored, especially with the monument that they have it somewhere. You know, it's put them into the history of, um, of the Redden community and it's the Forbury Gardens. The memorial was made in close collaboration with the families. Along with their names, it says, United forever, never will we walk by without remembering you. And that's what the families hope, that this will keep their memories alive and provide a place where people can pay their respects. After the unveiling, the friends and families of the victims attended a private memorial at St Lawrence Church before joining the public for a minute's silence in the gardens. As dusk settled, three beams of light shone into the night sky, in memory of James, Joe and David, and everybody affected. Natalie Verney, ITV News. Parents from the Thames Valley have travelled to Parliament to protest over what they say is the government's failure to support children with special educational needs. Well, one mother from Oxfordshire says people don't understand how difficult the system is. A petition has been handed in to Downing Street. James Dunham has more. Behind every colourful banner, families so desperately let down by the system, they see protesting the only way to deliver drastic change. There's no sense of support in the schools. It's very, very limited. Our children have been let down, they've been failed. In the school I went to was so bad that I tried to escape. Jessica from Abingdon is trying to get her six-year-old a specialist place. I want to be able to provide for him everything that he needs and I'm so frustrated at the moment because I can't. I can't give him the education that he deserves. Becky from TAME is representing her son Henry, who she fears could end up in an unsuitable school this September. The day-to-day -day battles that we go through every day is just undeniable um, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, people and children are just getting, being failed. It, it just has to change. Much of the frustration here relates to education, health and care plans, an assessment that a child needs so they can be directed to specific support. But almost a decade since their introduction, many families say the process is too slow and if and when help does arrive, it is often inadequate. According to government statistics, the number of EHCPs issued within the 20-week legal time limit in Oxfordshire last year was 1 in 10. In Buckinghamshire, it was 6 in 10 and in Hampshire, 5 in 10. Campaigners believe there needs to be more funding for send places and trained staff, with TV presenter Carrie Grant, whose son is autistic, supporting families here. That message of being out of school tells our children you're not good enough, you don't fit, there's no one, you're not, you're not, you don't fit this world, there's no one for you, you don't, you don't work. And so how is that child then going to feel confident enough to go into a working environment, go back into the world and say, hey, I belong here. They don't feel like they belong. Every message is telling them they don't belong. A 60,000 strong petition was handed into Downing Street with a plea. Don't close the door on our children's futures. James Dunham, ITV News, Westminster. We can cross now to our political correspondent Phil Hornby. So, Phil, what has the government been, what has the government been saying to this? Well, very often, Sangeeta, in situations like this, the government say the protesters have got it wrong and everything's fine. Not in this case. The government admit there are real problems, but say they do have a plan. We know that the system has lost the confidence of parents and carers. We need to regain that trust by improving the support that is ordinarily available. Finally, we've increased the high needs budget by over 50% in the past four years. We now need to make sure that funding is being well spent. 
The government say a plan will take time and there's an urgent need for help now. What is the government doing right now for the children in the system today? How can parents, carers and families be better supported now for the children whose needs are currently going unmet? Talk to MPs and there seem to be different problems all across our region, including in Oxfordshire. Send provision is one of the most critical issues for education uh, in uh, Oxfordshire and there's frequently uh, exasperation expressed by parents who are frustrated by Oxfordshire County Council's processes. Now I really welcome the extra funding that she's put in, that extra 50% uh, that's gone in since 2019 levels, but what's she doing to work with local authorities to make sure we cut through the bureaucracy, get people assessed and get that help to where it's needed? Well, the government told us tonight where local areas are failing, the Department for Education will intervene to address weaknesses. They stress the government are spending more money and are calling for big improvements. Phil, thank you. Now you're watching ITV News Meridian. Uh, more to come on the programme, of course. Thousands of Stonehenge for the summer solstice. But what is it and why do so many people celebrate it? And for more news from right across the region, please head to our website, itv.com forward slash Meridian. Remember, you can give us a call. Our number is on the screen now. It's 0808 1010 095. Remember, you can also follow us. That's on Facebook, that's on Twitter and on Instagram. Now, tomorrow marks 75 years since an event which helped define modern Britain. The ship, the Windrush, arrived from the Caribbean, bringing with it one of the first large groups of West Indian immigrants. They came to plug a jobs gap created by World War II. And Windrush has now come to symbolise a generation of Commonwealth citizens who reshaped society. Derek Johnson has been meeting people who built a new life here in the South. In Jamaica, they couldn't find work. Discouraged but full of hope, they sailed for Britain. Citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Empire Windrush arrives in Britain in 1948, with hundreds of passengers from the Caribbean responding to Britain's post-war labour shortage. How have you come to England? To seek a job. Many were ex-service personnel, such as Alford Gardner, who stayed and built a new life. Just a happy journey. Nine percent of us decided we could we work for five years just to have enough money to go home and invest. There's that much work to do, that much money you could earn. It only to find when come there wasn't that money to earn. <laughs> <laughs> the Windrush passengers were among the first wave of people from what are now Commonwealth countries who came en masse to the UK to work. Thousands arrived in Southampton on passenger ships such as this one. Those who stayed in the city congregated in the Nicholstown area, where there's now this mural. Many, though, found a chilly welcome. Jamaican-born Beverly Dowdell came in 1971 as a fully qualified nurse. I was asked by one of the senior nurses, how much money did you bring with you? Because so many of you people come here and expect the British government to pay your fare back. Well, I was a young woman, I was pretty mouthy, I still am, and um, I told her she did not need not to worry about that. People had to rely on each other, so they started to develop their own cultures. They were only really allowed to live in certain parts of the city, so that brought them closely together. And of course, they traded information and talk and gossip about the experiences that each, each of them had. This event, organised by Black History Month Southampton, is about connecting people in their communities, including younger people, with the past. I obviously knew about Windrush, but I didn't know as much. And hearing stories from people's point of view, live and direct, it's so warming, it's so, it makes it become real. It's easy to not think about it and not question it, um, especially as times get more progressive it's easy to forget but I think like things like today have shown how much your current identity is impacted by the generations that have come before. There's no doubt that for those who arrived on Windrush or who came after prejudice and discrimination were part of everyday life and of course many problems still exist in society today. Windrush though has become a symbol for all those people who rebuilt and reshaped Britain turning it into a truly 
multicultural country. Derek Johnson, ITV News, Southampton. And it is Windrush Day tomorrow and we'll have more stories for you on the programme. Now, while many of us have been enjoying the recent warm weather, there's a warning that it's created a breeding ground for ticks. Yes, tick bites can be linked to many viruses, including Lyme disease. Our reporter Amrit Birdie has been finding out why we should think about covering up to avoid ticks and how to prevent being bitten. Summer in the UK means one thing for many of us, shorts weather. But for those who like to get out into the countryside, having skin on show at this time of year can have frightening consequences. Just ask Tracy Winchester. Three years ago, after taking her dog for a walk, she noticed an unusual itchy rash on her leg. It was under my trousers and I didn't have time to deal with it, so I just kind of got on with the day, but it was really irritating me. In the end, I had a fast track referral because they were worried that there was something sinister going on. Um, and then in the end, we sort of went to um, ear, nose and throat department at the local hospital. And they just sort of very flippantly went, when I said about the history and what had happened recently, yeah, it's probably because of the Lyme disease. And then I was just sort of like, oh, OK. The sort of bizarreness of the, the sort of, you'll have almost like periods of different flare ups of different random stuff. My, my cogn cognitive skills just aren't what they were. I would imagine there's so many people out there probably with symptoms that don't realise what it is. The government estimates there's around two to 3,000 new cases of tick-borne Lyme disease every year in England and Wales. Professor Saul Faust from Southampton says there are some key symptoms to look out for. People who do get bitten by a tick shouldn't worry because most ticks don't carry Lyme disease or any other infections and we only ever use antibiotics when there are symptoms such as a rash or the more serious things like joint problems or neurological problems or much more rarely heart problems. But it's not just Lyme disease that we need to protect against. There's another life-altering tick-borne condition that causes the brain to swell. We've just had our first confirmed domestic case of tick-borne encephalitis in the UK. I think the message to get across to people is this is a preventable disease with the right knowledge. If we try and encourage schools to put um, awareness information out, if they're doing school trips where they're likely to um, meet up with ticks, uh, they need uh, to uh, make sure the children are aware. If we can prevent a bite, then you're minimising the, ch the chance of getting any of these diseases. There are ways to significantly reduce you and your family's chances of getting bitten by a tick, such as using an insect repellent that repels biting insects, like ticks and mosquitoes, wearing long sleeve tops and tucking trousers into socks to reduce skin exposure. When hiking or doing other outdoor activities, stick to pathways where there tends to be less long grass having a shower as soon as you return indoors and always checking yourself, your children and your pets for ticks and brush off any that are unattached. Covering up in the countryside might just save your life. Amrit Birdie, ITV News. Now we have featured some impressive charity challenges in our time, but this one is right up there. It involves a man called Ken, had a boat called Yoda, and it took four years to complete. Yes, Ken Fowler from Mudderford in Dorset has circumnavigated all 262 islands around England and Wales, raising £66,000 for cancer research and Oakhaven Hospice Trust. Uh, Ken joins us in the studio to talk about this. Ken, I guess first of all, four years, 262 islands, 1,300 miles. Why? A uh, really, really good question. Uh, for me, in a word, cancer. Um, sadly, my dad was one of six siblings. Five of them died of cancer, uh, and I also lost my mother-in-law to cancer. Uh, and I really wanted to find an event that would really make a difference. Um, and it's all about fundraising. Uh, and I have a picture of my mother-in-law and my father on my boat. And during some of the really tough 12-hour long days in wild conditions, they have just been the most amazing inspiration for us. So a very personal challenge, and you mentioned your boat there. It's called Yoda, so you're a Star Wars fan. Uh, not necessarily a Star Wars fan, but we ran a competition to name the boat, uh, and somebody came up with the name Yoda, uh, and it just really seemed appropriate. Something really, really small, uh, achieving something absolutely massive. And when we're talking on the radio, it's a really short call sign, so for us, it worked perfectly. And the, the boat, I mean, this isn't a luxurious 
journey that you've been on, is it really? Tell us a bit about the boat. Absolutely not, Matt. Uh, the boat, I would say to people, it literally is twice as big as your bathtub. It's generally about as wet as your bathtub. Uh, and for those people that have got a Labrador dog, it weighs just as much as that. So you spend literally half of your time hanging out the side of the boat. Uh, it's constant, it's physical. When you come off the water after 10 hours, you are completely drained. But it's just a wonderful way to see the scenery, to experience the sea. And you've had some great adventures in Yoda, haven't you? We've had some great adventures. We've capsized under bridges. We've carried boats over roads. We've sailed past a walrus. Uh, we've been having dolphins bouncing off the bow wave. Um, probably one of the most unusual things, we actually ended up rescuing some people while we were trying to sail around an island. And the tide was rushing in really quickly. And I saw two young children on this island waving at me and screaming. So I sailed across to them and they shouted, can you help us, can you help us, we're trapped. I could only take them across the water one at a time. And yet inadvertent kind of rescuer, you know, I, I think I was just fortunate to be at, at the right time at the right place. It's an amazing story. And just tell us briefly, you have seen some amazing things on your travels. I have. I've seen just absolutely amazing scenery. You know, we've sailed past castles. Uh, we've been through really narrow gaps. We've sailed past historic places. Uh, and the scenery is absolutely breathtaking. Normally when you're there, you are the only boat out there. So it's actually kind of quite a, quite a serene, peaceful, lovely world. But the conditions are often really, really brutal. Well, look, congratulations on your achievement. It is incredible. And thank you very much for coming in and telling us all about it, Ken. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Now, if you're a dog lover but haven't been able to give one a home because of work commitments, then this next story is for you. Because the Guide Dog Charity, which is based in Reading, is looking for foster carers to look after dogs in training. The organisation is reassuring those concerned about the cost of living and work commitments that looking after a dog is possible with their help. To explain more, here's Grace Williams. Okay, you can come over there. Meet Eric. He's 16 months old and is 11 weeks into his training to become a guide dog. The Labrador Retriever Cross goes to puppy school five days a week at the Guide Dog Charity headquarters in Reading. The lessons with his handler Amy involve learning patience, obedience and simulating real life scenarios. Good boy! After about 20 weeks of training, dogs like Eric are then matched with guide dog users. When we're matching our dogs, we're matching them to the right client, um, that the partnership is as safe as possible when they're out working um, in their daily lives. But the charity would like to do more matchmaking of a different kind, this time between the dogs and potential fosterers. Those selected will take care of the puppies for around six months while they go through their training before finding their forever homes. A recent study by the Guide Dogs charity found that nearly half of people in the UK who don't own dogs would like to, but only 4% can commit to full-time care due to work. And 40% have changed their minds about owning a dog due to the cost of living crisis. You drop off the dog each day at the local office and then pick it up um, in the evening. So it's a bit like the school run for the dog, so that would fit in around someone's working day. Um, and also guide dogs cover all of the costs of the dog. So we pay vet bills, we organise food, so people wouldn't have to worry about that. There are currently 107 guide dogs in training in the South East, just like Rory, and the guide dog charity is asking more volunteers to come forward to look after them. Oh Angie from Basingstoke has always wanted a pet dog, but found work got in the way of her being able to look after one full time. A friend recommended she foster a guide dog, and over the last two and a half years, she's had four. Angie has been looking after 14-month-old Rory since May. What's it like to be a volunteer? Having this lovely dog, it's like in the mornings. You can't have a bad morning because you get such a lovely greeting. And, you, and if you've had a bad day at work, you pick him up and he's just so adorable. All sort of, he just puts the world back to rights. After they've gone, sort of like eight weeks later when they've qualified, you get a, a lovely photo of them in their guide dog harness and you're just so proud that they're going to change somebody's life. So if you're a dog lover with a loving home who likes cuddles and long walks, you too could become a guide dog fosterer. Grace Williams, ITV News, Reading. <laughs> oh, and they do do such important work. Pip's with us now. So, Pip, I have been up since five o'clock this morning, not because I wanted to get up, just because I could not sleep, because it was like 
bright and what's going on it's the longest yeah. day well it's the long it might feel Probably. like the longest day for you it is actually the longest day yes today is the summer solstice the start of astronomical summer and the place to be this morning was stonehenge we sent our camera crew out nice and early now the solstice itself is a very precise moment in time when the north pole is at its maximum tilt towards the sun it happened at exactly 3 57 this afternoon and of course it gives us our longest day here in the northern hemisphere by the end of today we'll have clocked up around 16 and a half hours of daylight across the UK and there were plenty of hardy souls out making the most of it this morning. It was cold, it was a cold night but yes it's quite spectacular when the sun has come up. Great, yes, we've had a just, lovely, lovely morning. A memorable day. Yes. Obviously Stonehenge is such a great archaeological site and we wanted to see it. Just ecstatic really, a bit tired but yeah it's been up all night but uh, it's well worth it, it's lovely. So some, some happy souls there. A bit of solstice trivia for you, just in case you should ever acquire it. The word solstice loosely translates as the sun stands still. Basically, if you were to draw the arc of the sun's movement every day for a year, you'd find that about a week or so either side of each solstice, it would be in almost exactly the same position. Fantastic. Now, I guess, obviously, so however you measure it, summer has now started. It has. Rumours it's going to get even hotter. Yeah, that's right. It is going to get a bit hotter into the weekend. It looks as though we could be creeping back up to around 30 degrees Celsius. When you think the average at this time of year is about 20, we'll be well above that. But if you struggle with the heat like I do, then you'll be pleased to hear that Monday looks a little bit fresher for all of us. <laughs> OK, so possibly something to please everybody. Let's get a check with the full forecast details, of course. Here's Pip. Feels like home, whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps, sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. So the summer solstice today, the longest day and the start of summer officially for many. And how are things looking? Well, they're looking pretty promising, mostly dry, plenty of sunshine and actually feeling a bit hotter as we head into the weekend. So this is what's going on over the coming days. High pressure building in from the south and west, settling things down for a time and dragging in that warmer air. But worth noting on Sunday, a little weak weather front starting to move in from the west. That could bring a few more showers for a time and it will also introduce something a little fresher as we go into the start of next week. Out there at the moment, though, things looking very quiet. Any lingering daytime showers quickly fading away. And overnight tonight, we're looking at dry and fairly clear conditions. With light winds, too, we could see some areas of mist and fog forming by dawn. And temperatures for most of us staying up in the low to mid-teens. Rural spots perhaps dipping just a touch lower. So tomorrow morning, any early mistiness soon dispersing. The sunshine quickly getting to work. And then through the day, we'll see a little bit of cloud bubbling up into the early afternoon. The chance of a few showers once again, very few and far between. Temperatures of anything a little higher than today and continuing to climb as we head through the weekend. Valent. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Hello, Summer. Piri sponsors ITV Pollen Count. Well, grass pollen season is very much at its peak at the moment. Levels over the next few days will be very high. And we will also have a bit of nettle and dock pollen thrown in for good measure too. Take care. Bye-bye. So are we going to do Stonehenge next year? We could do that. That'd be yeah, good. I was up. I could have you done it this anyway. year. Yeah, I don't know about doing a live like Philippa just suggested. OK, maybe we will. <laughs> That's it from us for this evening. The ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale is coming up. As soon. long as you put daisies in your hair. Of course. Okay. Why wouldn't I? I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>